Well, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the fraud and scam prevention uh, hour that we'll be giving and offering to you for uh, the next little while. My name's Sean Smith. I'm a retired detective with the Sacramento Sheriff's Office, recently retired uh, December of last year. And while I was at the Sheriff's Office for close to 30 years, I worked about half of that time, about 15, 16 years over at the Sacramento Valley High Tech Crimes Task Force, where we investigate identity theft, fraud, and elder abuse type of uh, fraudulent complaints and investigations. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to offer you some uh, ideas and solutions to protect yourself and give you some ideas today uh, from my end up, the high tech task force end of things on uh, what's out there and what to be aware of. And good morning, oh good afternoon. My name is John Fan. I'm a police detective with Sacramento Police Department. Uh, I've been with the department for about 20 years. Uh, for 10 of the years, I was assigned to investigate robberies and burglaries, and I work closely with our Asian community, uh, Stockton Boulevard, uh, Green Haven Pocket area, uh, Meadowview area, uh, when we had a rash of um, robberies and burglaries. Um, seems like it was targeting against our Asian community, uh, starting back in 2016, 2015, 2016. Um, so we did uh, quite a few uh, community outreach presentations just like this uh, with our Asian community. Um, I was here in person um, maybe three, four years ago. Uh, we had a little meeting, uh, a little presentation here. Uh, I'm glad that you guys invited, invited us back. Thank you for having us. Okay, so we'll get started. Now, I'm filling in today uh, for Detective Sam Bates. You see his name on there, but he had a conflict, wasn't able to make it today. But this is uh, coming out and, and getting out to the community besides the investigations we do. Uh, this is a huge part of what the task force uh, ha has a duty to. Uh, because just to give you an idea, in Sacramento County alone, just the unincorporated part of Sacramento, which is our jurisdiction, uh, we probably take in historically about 250 to 300 identity theft related reports per month, of which we have currently three detectives, uh, three sheriff's detectives, a probation officer, and a CHP officer who are tasked with investigating those. So you can imagine uh, the vast majority of those, there's just too many crimes that are committed out there and not enough of us to do it. So the better way to help prevent you from becoming victimized or give you tips on what to do should you become victimized is to get out and have this outreach. Um, so, we'll just get started here. Now, the first question, have you ever been a victim? And I know we're on a Zoom meeting, we're virtual right now, uh, and of course it's a little difficult to answer, but I would hazard a guess that uh, absolutely every one of you that's watching either unfortunately has been a victim or definitely knows somebody who has been victimized. And before we jump too far into the presentation here on, on this half, um, just wanted to let you know, any questions you have, uh, we won't wait till the end. Please feel free to Post them in the comments, and as we go, uh, as you think of them, and then we will address those at the very end if we haven't covered them during the presentation. So, usually this is kind of an in-person exercise, but this is what we're going to cover today. Uh, what is identity theft and who can actually become a victim? How do the bad guys and gals out there get our information? How do they use it? What are they doing with it? What can we do to protect ourselves? who you can call if you are a victim, and who are the stakeholders. And I'll address four and five right now uh, because we'll focus most of the presentation on what they're doing out there and how we can protect ourselves. So as far as who to call if you're the victim of identity theft, state law in California says, hey, you can call the agency, uh, the police agency where you live. Uh, so if you live in Sacramento City, the city of Sacramento, you can call the Sacramento Police Department, even if, let's say, your bank account information or your credit card was used in New York. You don't have to go through a phone tree to call New York to report the crime. You're allowed to go in California, make a crime report with your jurisdiction uh, where, you, where you live. And then that jurisdiction doesn't necessarily have the obligation to investigate it, but they will pass on that report to wherever, whatever agency where the crime actually was committed so they can uh, hopefully investigate it. And who are the stakeholders? It's everybody, it's all of us. You are the main stakeholder out there because you're the one we're trying to protect from being victimized. But identity theft is kind of a front end, back end type of a crime. The person has whatever type of ID theft, whether it's credit card, check fraud, 
anything uh, social security fraud that's committed against them, there's a secondary victim as well. And that's going to be the bank, the financial institution, the credit card company um, that should refund your information or refund your, your loss uh, as soon as you report it to them. So what we'll do is we'll start going through here and uh, go through the slides and talk about now what is ID theft and how do these people out there get our information. So if you are wondering, do, am I lucky enough to live in a state where ID theft is occurring quite frequently? Don't worry, you're in good company because California has traditionally been the number one state for identity theft reports. Uh, and, and that is people who take the time who have been victimized to actually go and then report that to, um, to the law enforcement and to the actual uh, the identity theft uh, federal government site. So California, number one, and unfortunately Sacramento area and the Sacramento, greater Sacramento region has always hovered right about number 50 for cities across the United States for identity theft victims. And as you can see, when we talk about stakeholders, uh, our audience today, you know, we're prime targets. Uh, you look at the number of reports, this is from 2020, the number of reports there where from ages 50 and up, you are basically, those percentages are right about, what, 34, 50, 65 percentish of the identity theft that occurs, occurs in that age, age bracket. And it's becoming much, much more prevalent as time goes on, as criminals become a lot more sophisticated. So if you're ever wondering, what does ID theft mean? It doesn't mean just your check, your credit card, or that. ID theft is personal identifying information. And that includes anything on this list right here, plus anything else that is unique to you as an individual. So if somebody uses your name and address, if they use your driver's license for something, uh, if they use your employee ID number, your spouse's name, your mother's maiden name, uh, if they use your fingerprint, anything that's unique to you as an individual and unique to uh, a business or whether that individual is alive or deceased, if their information is used that constant in, in a fraudulent manner, whether it's to get money or any other illegal means, that constitutes identity theft. And you saw a big, huge uh, increase in the last couple of years uh, with the unemployment fraud that occurred in California where your name and your address and your date of birth may have been used unknowingly to you for someone to file unemployment in your name where they would receive the funds from unemployment and using your your information so it, mm -hmm. it can attack you at any any different any one of a number of different angles We'll skip past this because I'm not going to bore anybody with the crime, what the actual code is for identity theft, but it's a pretty broad code. So one of the best things, one of the easiest things to do and to remember with, with us is when you have information, whether it's a credit offer, whether it's whatever type of mail you get, when you're done with that, uh, don't just toss it out in the recycle bin. Uh, don't just rip it up in a couple mm -hmm. of different pieces. Invest in a good shredder and invest in what you would call the crosscut shredder. So a lot of the old shredders, they'd have just the strings, but we have gone out to hotel rooms, we've gone out to apartments uh, where we've done searches and these people have taken the strings from recycle bins and put them back together. They've made, re-put the um, driver's licenses back together, your bank account statements back together, checks back together, anything you could name it. They sit up there all night long, they're probably high on drugs, and they're, they're trying to put those pieces of the puzzle back together to then victimize you. So it makes it a lot more difficult if you do that cross-cut uh, confetti type of shredder because it chips it up really small and it's virtually impossible for them to do that. And they'll go out there a number of different ways. We see this all the time. Most businesses today are pretty good about disposing of your information because uh, they can't just throw it out in the dumpster or they're liable and they can get fined for that. Uh, but they'll, any which way they can get your information, mail, a very good source for them right there. So think about what you're putting in your mailbox, you know, receiving things in your mailbox. Uh, if you know when the mail person comes to deliver, go out there right afterwards and get the mail out of there. If you're going to mail something out, 
that little red flag on the side of your mailbox, if you have, I live in a rural area, so I still have a, a mailbox like that. That red flag just tells the criminal out there, hey, there's something good I might want to take a look at in here. So if you have a standalone mailbox, or your friends and family do, invest in a locking one. It makes it a little bit more difficult for them. Or if you're going to mail something out sensitive, uh, probably the best place to do it is to go into the post office and toss that letter right into the wall. You know, they, the, the blue boxes are, are secured, but criminals go out there and they'll actually take uh, a stick with a rat trap, a sticky rat trap, and we've caught them going out there and fishing out the mail on a Sunday night when it's full Ooh. and pulling all of that stuff out. Cluster boxes in apartment complexes or complex, uh, you know, senior complexes where you have potentially a cluster box. Uh, the U.S. Postal Service, they've had their keys stolen, break-ins and such. One key will open up the entire cluster box. So that's something else to, to be aware of. If it's something sensitive, probably the safest place is to go mail that out right from the post office itself. Because once they get your information, uh, they can do a lot of stuff with it. You looked at those checks that were, uh, we'll talk about check fraud right now. You know, they don't even need to steal the check that's delivered to you or or that you're mailing out. All they need to do is crack open the check or the envelope just slightly to be able to get two things from the check, a routing number and the account number itself. And so you can see on this slide right here, the bottom check is gonna be the legitimate check that was actually stolen. Uh, so they take that routing number, which is the long number on the kind of the middle at the very bottom of the real check on the bottom half of the screen, uh, and the account number will be to the right of it. And they just take check writing software, which is totally legitimate, but they'll take that, input those in there, and create all sorts of new checks off of it. And a lot of this crime, uh, they'll create checks that are about 1000 to 1200 bucks because they pass them off at check cashing places as payroll checks. And so the, the issue with checks is, if this is your check that's gone out, and it may have reached its destination and been cashed legitimately, but if they don't dispose of it correctly and some criminal gets a hold of it, then they can go and start creating new checks, counterfeiting new ones, passing them off, and then it's probably five or six days before it potentially hits your bank account that you realize that, hey, somebody has cashed a, an illegitimate check against your account, and then you have to go through the steps with your bank to go shut down the account and create a new one and remedy all the, uh, the fraud that's occurred. And think about like situational awareness and what we, what we leave in our vehicles when we're driving around. Never ever, and this is pretty common sense, but don't leave mm. anything in your vehicle uh, that's of value, whether it's personal identifying information or anything else, uh, that somebody may pique their interest, that a thief is gonna look and, and be interested in taking. Uh, so you can see in that picture on the right, you have a phone, you have a purse, definitely things you don't wanna leave in the front seat of a car whatsoever. Uh, you wanna keep those things with you or put them into your trunk and out of view from anybody that's passing by. And pay attention to when you're loading things into your car and the, the uh, surroundings and people around you when you do so. Uh, if somebody sees you loading something that's a nice piece of electronic equipment or big bags that look like it came from a nice store into the trunk of your car, you know, that could identify you as a target. So just be aware, it's not to make you paranoid, but take a peek around you, see who's a, uh, out and about around you, wherever you're shopping, and be cautious about, you know, putting that stuff. If you're leaving, hey, put it in the front seat with you, uh, and then just go from there. But if you are, you know, going shopping again, definitely, again, keep that stuff out of view. This is always a good topic uh, that people are interested in is your debit and credit cards and like the difference between the two. And I could tell you that they're really in terms of fraud, there's no difference between the two in terms of the ID thief's ability to steal your money. They both work the same, a number is a number. The major difference between debit and credit is that your debit card is tied directly to your bank account. So you have liquid cash that they can steal. Your credit card, you know, is, is one that's on your terms of agreement. You know, you're paying that back on a monthly basis. So the difference being, if the ID thief gets a hold of my debit card and takes that number and is able to take money, and we'll talk about how they do that in a second, take money out of my account, that comes directly out of my bank account. If they are able to go and uh, commit fraud against my credit card, 
well, that money, that liquid money is not gone right then. Uh, I still have time, that 30 days, to go ahead and dispute that with my credit card company and report the fraud. So the point behind this is, and we'll talk about some of the areas where they steal this information, would be if you have the ability to use a credit card versus a debit card, you're a little bit safer in the, the respect that you won't lose that cash immediately out of your bank account, bank account if you're victimized. And always keep an eye on your card. Now this can be difficult, right? If we go to restaurants, and a lot of times, you know, more and more I think um, restaurants do a lot of the payment right at the table um, or other stores, or if your card goes out of sight, it takes no time at all for people to use a little tiny device that's called a skimming device to swipe your card and steal your information. I know years ago we had a case, uh, it was a beauty supply store here in Sacramento, where it was probably about fifty or sixty thousand dollars worth of fraud all the victims had shopped at this beauty store and we found that one of the employees had the apron and in the apron she had a tiny little device no bigger than the size of a credit card uh, that she would distract you when asking you to fill out like a rewards uh, membership and as you did that and she went to make your uh, take your your card for payment uh, she would pretend to reach down for a pin into her apron and slide a hand just swipe the card and then run it through the machine, charge you legitimately, and go on. And then in the meantime, that little tiny machine had captured your card information and she would pass off to uh, her boyfriend who would then go make a bunch of fake cards and go to ATMs to take the money out. But a lot of times, you know, your card information, the bank or the, uh, the card number itself, you, you don't really know where it has been compromised because many of the cases with credit card fraud, the victims still have the card with them they've never lost the card and so there's a myriad of different ways where people all they need to do is steal that number chip cards if you're aware of them are a much more secure way of using uh, cards today and it's a mandatory thing for uh, issuers to to have those chip cards uh, so instead of that magnetic strip they'll, they'll, most of your cards are still going to have that magnetic strip but they the card will be forced to use the chip not the magnetic strip because um, on that mag stripe, there is absolutely no protection whatsoever. There's no security uh, on that. It's very easy to swipe and read the numbers clearly. Uh, versus a chip, it is, uh, not to get into the weeds, but the, uh, the security measures behind it a lot, lot better. So these are an example of the devices I was talking about. You can see how small they are, where they're able to take your card information and go and swipe that, skim it, and what they'll do is take another machine and punch in your card number and swipe it in that machine, which imprints it onto that magnetic stripe right there. And you can get all this stuff off of Amazon or eBay for probably about, I'd say probably 60, 70 bucks. And that's what they do. They go buy this, these little bits of equipment and uh, figure out how to get your card number, whether they're buying them from illicit online internet sites or they're skimming from stores or they're getting your information by using skimming devices, which are placed on ATM or gas pumps. So when you go to an ATM, you know, we feel pretty secure. We put our card in there, but what do we also have to put in? We have to put in the PIN code to be able to access our account and get our money out. Over the years, criminals have created and bought these devices that uh, we call overlay skimmers. So skimmer goes on top of the real legitimate card reader for the ATM machine and looks like it's a part of the machine. Your card goes in the slot. Meanwhile, it gets read by the real ATM at the same time being read by the criminal's uh, machine that's set on top. So that will take the information from your card, but what they also need is a camera to look at your pin. So the slide on the right with the arrow shows a little tiny disc that's actually a micro camera that uh, will view the pin pad right there. So the criminals see the card go in and then they can marry up the card number with the pin that was input and as soon as they do that they can go right to creating another card going to any ATM machine using your pin code to withdraw your cash out. So when you go to an ATM machine 
those are, those are ones, maybe things will look a little out of place. You can see if there's something that doesn't look like it belongs on um, kind of the cover for the ATM machine, you definitely want to be wary about that. I would not use that machine and I would, if the bank's open, I'd go report it to the bank. But as time's gone, gone on, these, these people out here have become much more sophisticated. And these devices right here are what you call shimmers, which actually go inside the ATM card slot. So you, as a user, will never know. Like people, if you looked at ATM footage of me, you think I'm crazy because every time I go up there, I jiggle the, the card reader, I jiggle the camera, make sure that it's not something somebody else put on there. But these devices right here actually go inside the card slot. And so you will no, have no idea. Even the bank doesn't have any idea that it's in there because it doesn't set off any alarms. Uh, and we've had several cases over the past couple of years where groups have flown into, from other countries, have flown into the States, into Sacramento, to go put these shimmers into ATM machines and steal hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars from unknowing victims. So the thing with ATMs is, uh, before we go on to gas pump, the thing with ATM machine is, if something looks out of the ordinary, like if you go to a Wells Fargo machine, and you always know that they have the pin pad cover, but you go to an ATM machine that's Wells Fargo and it doesn't have it, then you know, remember that and go, ah, you know what, I don't think that belongs, I'm gonna go tell the bank about it. Because what these criminals come in and do is they take off the covers, they'll clean it so it'll get rid of the, the goo that sticks the cover to it, uh, and then they'll put their own devices on top like I was explaining. So if something looks out of place, doesn't look right, definitely avoid using that machine and report it to whatever bank it is. Another prime place where they're getting your card information is from gas pump skimmers. And this is another one where you'll never ever know whether the criminal or whether anything is put on the pump itself. So in the top, or as top left, um, you can see kind of the guy pointing to the little ribbon. All that ribbon is, most of the ribbons in there are legitimate, but what the criminal does, what the thief does is he or she will go get a key to the machine, however they do it, stealing it. Some machines have generic keys that work on multiple stations. They'll go in there, they'll disconnect the real ribbon and put their skimming device ribbon, which is that bottom right picture, in between. So it's kind of a pass through. So you go out, you use your card number and those devices right there uh, will, will actually capture both your card number and anything you enter on the pin pad. So when I talked about the difference between credit card and debit card, here's where you'll never know whether that's on the actual machine itself. So for gas stations, if you can afford to, uh, which, I mean, hey, who can afford gas today anyway, right? Uh, but for, for stations, if you can afford to, go use a credit card or more safely go inside to pay, as inconvenient as it might be, um, to use the machine inside versus the pump. But if you use your credit card outside, they can still steal your money, right? Because typically you'll have to, you, with a credit card, you're gonna use the zip code, not the PIN number. Uh, and when you do that, what that will allow them to do is actually just use that card and they can still steal it by using the card and that zip code at another gas station. So they'll basically use your card to go buy gas for themselves. If you have to use a debit card at the gas station, uh, you can also, most stations now have the bypass the pin or asks you, is it a debit or a credit card? Just select the credit option because that will default for you to then put in your zip code, not your PIN code, and it limits the amount of money that they would be able to take out of your account until you notice that something's bad. So there's a question. Uh, has there been any efforts to stop thieves from putting these devices into ATM machines by the banks or gas stations, like alarms or extra, extra cameras? Yes, there has been. Um, some ATMs, you may have noticed, I think it's uh, one of the local credit unions, they put a new device in where your card actually goes in long ways or sideways basically and then once it's inside it flips around and then reads the card that way and these criminals are good I mean that lasted for about a month or two and the criminals were able to craft another reader that would actually do and mimic the same thing um, so they put a lot of effort into it because it's in their best interest to protect you as one of their customers, right? One of their clients. So banks definitely are on the lookout for that. There are uh, devices that banks have purchased where you can go out and check the ATM machines to see if there is an actual skimmer in there, like at the beginning of the day, end of the day, that type of thing. Uh, and then for gas stations, they're looking at, yeah, devices that are alarms that if there's a disconnect, maybe it shuts down the pump 
for a period of time if somebody's accessed the pump. And then we've done a lot of outreach with those stations as well in the, in the Sacramento area and have a project going right now uh, that should be up and running where we're going to have some of our volunteers driving around and trying to look with uh, some technology for those gas pump skimmers. And is there any efforts on the stop, uh, stop selling skimming devices? There really isn't, uh, and uh, the reason is this. Skimming devices in and of themselves are not illegal, right? So you can use a skimming device as a business, uh, I'm, and when I say skimming, I mean a card reader is what I mean. Uh, so the devices aren't really sold as, as a legitimately as something, hey, go out and commit theft. They're a card reader, which, you know, uh, Restaurants and bars will use them to look at driver's licenses to see if the license mag stripe number matches what's imprinted on the license to get rid of fake IDs. So, you know, things like that or to verify cards, businesses can use them. They don't have to buy like the regular ATM machines depending on what kind of system they have. So there's not, I don't, not to my knowledge, there's an effort to go stop it because those devices aren't illegal. It's just they're being used illegally. So pretty common sense, whenever you go there, always protect your pin. A lot of ATMs say that, you know, just cover it real quick. If you looked at me, I look like a little, you know, I look like I'm a weirdo because I put my whole body above the, the pin pad there just to make sure that none of the cameras that might be on the ATM are gonna be able to view what pin I put in there. Don't write down your pin on anything because if you do, you write it down on a card so you remember your pin. Hey, if your wallet, your purse, or that item gets stolen, then obviously they have the keys to the kingdom uh, for your information. We'll skip through this. Um, and then we'll get to giving out another area or talking about another area where people are stealing our information. Um, the one thing to remember with your bank accounts, before I forget, is always check them on a regular basis. Don't, don't do it monthly. If you can afford to and, and you have the capability to look at it online, I'd log in and look every couple of days or at least once a week uh, because you may not notice that charge or, or you might not notice the, uh, the theft of your money for a month, right? And then in the meantime, you're, you're out that money. And you, when you're looking at your bank account statements, you always want to look at charges that aren't necessarily like large dollar. You want to look at charges that are out of the ordinary. That could be a dollar, two dollars, four dollars, something like that, because those are test charges. So if the criminal gets a bunch of cards from a, a gas pump skimmer and they go test them out, not all the cards are going to work. So they have to go and make sure they're going to use the right one. So what they'll do is they'll go to vending machines. They'll use the card in a vending machine, buy a soda, buy a water, uh, see if it works. And if it works, it goes in the good pile. And if it doesn't go through, it goes in the bad pile and they won't use it. So look for those small dollar charges as well as the larger ones. And another area to protect ourselves, don't give out any information over the phone or over the internet whatsoever, unless you absolutely are 100% certain of the person you're talking to. Uh, more and more, we get tons of cases that come in that have to do with you know, somebody calling up, whether it's your car warranty is expired, or you need an, an addition to your insurance, or somebody to help with social security. There are a lot of scam artists out there uh, that are just trying to get information out of you or take your money. So if you get an unsolicited call from somebody, or you get something that's unsolicited over the internet where you, don't, you didn't expect it, on the internet, just delete it. On the phone call, just hang up the call. If they say they're from your bank or you get an email from your bank that says, click on this link uh, to fix something that's an issue with your account, that's not gonna happen. The, your bank will never do that. So delete that email, report it to your bank. Uh, if you get a call about something you know, personal to you that's kind of like a cold call to you, just politely hang up the phone and then you can dial the business, the bank or whomever directly at a number you know and trust to verify whether there is anything going on with your account. And this happens to everybody. It's happened to me, uh, all my partners at the office. I mean, this is just an ongoing thing. That's a kind of a funny one right there. Yeah, we'll get a lot of cases that come in where people say, hey, you know, they said they won the lottery, the Canadian lottery, Nigerian lottery, this lottery, that lottery. Um, just remember, if you never played that lottery, you're not going to win that lottery. So typically those scams may come in an email and say, hey, you've won a million dollars, but we need to pay the taxes up front. So send us a check for $80,000 
and then we'll go ahead, as soon as we receive the check, we'll give you your, earn, your winnings from the lottery. Um, these are all 100% scams. So again, you get something like that in the mail or an email, just delete, shred, get rid of it, don't entertain it whatsoever. And we've already talked about your bank statements. And if you have social media, just another caution before we, we wrap up here. Uh, social media, there's a lot of criminals that are out there really good at socially engineering. So be cautious about what you post or you know, how open your social media is. If you have it, hopefully you've got you know, closed off to like friends and family that you trust. Um, but this picture right here is a good one where you know, the couple is saying, hey, we're on vacation and we're out of town, you know, uh, wherever they were, the Bahamas or something like that. Well. If, some, if they have their account open, somebody can dig through their account, find out potentially where they live or where they might live, or get enough information about them from social media to use some other internet searching to figure out where they live, and now what information they have, well, they're not home, right? Nobody's gonna be there, so maybe it's a good time to break in, maybe it's a good time to go steal their mail or something like that. So just kind of common sense precautions uh, when we're talking about social media. We'll skip through the malware and ransomware because I want to be uh, cognizant of the time. I know I'm running into about a half an hour here. Um, but this is stuff that just goes on your computers that you want to make sure, you know, I talked about not clicking on links from places you, you don't recognize the email. These are some of the other things. Uh, if you do click on those links, that the, the criminals out there may be trying to put bad stuff on your computer or steal information from your computer itself. One of, the, one of the common ones on clicking on links now is uh, that it will create some type of soft, like malicious little virus in your computer that says, hey, your it pops up at the screen, your computer is broken now and you're gonna need Microsoft to fix it, so call Microsoft at this number. Uh, if you ever have something like that, then contact you know, somebody who is, is pretty good with computers or you can certainly call our office for some advice on it because it is not Microsoft sending that information to you. The number you call is gonna be a number where they're gonna take your money and just you know, steal 50, 80 bucks from you uh, for something that's completely, completely fake and a scam. As far as any of the apps that are on our phones, because everybody you know, has, has mobile apps and everything now, one of the questions we always get is, are mobile banking apps safe? And in my opinion, I do most of my my banking and everything is on mobile app on my phone. It's as safe as you are with the phone and how you're connecting up to that particular app. So your phones can connect up a couple different ways, right? We can connect up for our cell service. So if we have AT&T, our phone goes, you know, AT&T allows us to get out to the internet and use these apps. We can also connect up to wireless networks. So if you have your Wi-Fi at home, you can connect up through your Wi-Fi to go use your apps. As long as your Wi-Fi is set up safe at home, you're going to be just fine. The real caution is if you go and use any of these apps on somebody else's Wi-Fi, so let's say a coffee shop, a Starbucks, or if you go to the library and get on their Wi-Fi, or you go to the airport and you jump on their Wi-Fi, their Wi-Fi is not 100% secure. So anybody else that also gets on their Wi-Fi there are tools that are out there that allow them, the bad guy, to go and basically sniff all of the internet traffic and monitor and potentially steal your username, password, and see what you're doing on the internet. So if you're gonna use mobile banking, absolutely, it's safe. The banks spend a lot of money in keeping those secure. Um, if you're at home and your wireless is safe, feel perfectly comfortable to do so. If you're not at home, I would not ever use any of these apps uh, outside of my own cell service. So I wouldn't jump on somebody else's wireless network, like, like I said, at a Starbucks to go look at my bank account whatsoever. I would just turn off my wireless, use just my cell service, and then I would feel much more comfortable. And these payment apps are, are all safe as well. The legitimate ones that are out there that have been around for a period of time, I mean, I use Apple Pay all the time. It's a real secure way of, of uh, paying for things at stores that accept it, as are the others. You know, these reputable companies uh, put a lot of capital, they put a lot of money into making sure that, you know, they, those systems aren't exploited and that you're safe as a customer. Otherwise, they wouldn't exist anymore. Okay, so we'll, we'll wrap up with this right here, kind of like an overview of what we talked about earlier, um, but things to protect ourselves: Shred, shred, shred. If you get anything that's uh, in the good old US 
Postal Service or any of the other uh, mail services that are out there. Shred, shred, shred. Protect your mail. Don't give out info over the phone. Watch what we're leaving in our cars. Protect your cards and your PIN numbers. Uh, check your bank account statements regularly and don't give out anything personal over the internet or over the phone unless you absolutely know who the person is. And with that, um, if there are any other questions, we keep posting them, feel free to, and then we can address them at the very end. Otherwise, John, I'll turn it over to you. So a couple more things to add. One quick question for you, Sean, is what do you do if you are a victim of fraud? That's a very good question. One, I'm glad you reminded me because I, I, I did forget to talk about that. So here's what you want to do. If you're the victim, it's always been my advice to people. If you've been victimized, um, depending on what has occurred, if your bank account, has been hit or your credit card, immediately call those companies, okay, uh, and report it to them. Now, they may ask for a report number, but you want to stop any of the bleeding. So if it's a check and your, your actual bank account has been hit because your check has been stolen and somebody has created a fraud check, call the bank, say, you know, and, and typically any more banks used to, back in the day, they used to go and just say, well, monitor the account anymore. You just get a new account number issued. Same thing with cards. If your card has been compromised, just stop the card, uh, have a new card issued for you. Do that. And then secondly, so that, that's to get your money taken care of right away. And then secondly, call or more likely you're going to go on the internet if you can. You can call also your local agency and report that as well to get a report number. So if it's in SAC PD jurisdiction, I assume you guys can go online, yes. right? And go online. Same thing with the sheriff's office. You can go online and you can file a report, an identity theft report online, um, get that done for you. And then you'll have a report number to keep. The next thing you'd want to do, regardless of whether it's a bank account, a credit card, or some other type of fraud, because that's the scary thing about ID theft is you don't know exactly what information about you has been stolen, right? If I see that my credit card was, was compromised, um, well, that's something I know the criminals have, but heck, I don't know what other information they potentially might have about me. So what I would suggest is, regardless of the type of ID theft, uh, you can go to identitytheft.gov, and that site right there will walk you through the process of what to do if you've been victimized. One of the things will be to, you have the option of putting a credit, credit freeze on your credit. So basically, you call one of the three major creditor, credit reporting agencies, TransUnion, Equifax, or Experian, give them the report number, tell them the fraud has occurred, and then they will put a freeze on your social security number and your name to prevent anybody else from opening up a new line of credit. So it doesn't protect any current lines you have. So if you have, if you have a Macy's card, right, and you've already established it, had it for years, that's not going to stop any potential fraud there, but it will prevent anybody from using information about you to go and open up a new line of credit. And trust me, there have been plenty of cases where they do some outlandish stuff. We had a case a couple years ago, one of my, my largest cases I had, where through identity theft, this couple went and assumed the identity of, um, she was an elderly woman who was living in a care facility, uh, but still owned a home over in the Land Park area. Well, they ended up being able to, to uh, the female suspect went and it was kind of like a little red riding hood thing. She dressed up and did makeup as an, el and as an elderly woman, impersonated her, stole her house, sold her house, and use the funds from that to buy a new house for both of them out in North Sacramento. And so just from name, address, and social security number. So, you know, protecting all your information is super, super important. So you can go put that credit freeze on, uh, and then if you decide later, hey, I want to actually go and, you know, buy a car, or I want to open up a new line of credit, you can always unfreeze the credit for that period of time to do that. But basically, get, get your money taken care of and fixed right away. Report it to law enforcement, and then go to identitytheft.gov and follow what other steps and consider putting that credit freeze. And then do you have another no, one? No, thank or? you. So okay. just to add to that, uh, if you live in the city of Sacramento, uh, the three ways you can report a, a crime or report that you're, you're a victim of identity theft, uh, you can call a non-emergency number. That's 264-5471, 264-5471. Uh, 
uh, where we can come into our front counter. Luckily, our front counter is back open. Um, we, we, we had to close the front counter because of COVID. Uh, the address, if you live in this a area, the address is 5770 Freeport Boulevard. It's right up the street on Freeport. It's 5770 Freeport Boulevard. And the number three way is SACPD, S-A-C-P-D dot org. And there's a, a, a process you can actually follow report online. And those are the three ways, the three easiest ways uh, that you can report it to the city of Sacramento if you're ever a, a victim of ID theft. All right. And what's the phone number for So for the Sheriff's Department, in our jurisdiction, it would be 916-874-5115, 874-5115. Or you can go to sacsheriff.com, and then from that link, it has a link on filing an online report. Um, we have different service centers for the areas of the county, so if you called that non-emergency number that I just gave you, they could also direct you to the address of the service center where you live or your friends and family live, and they could do a walk-in. I think there's, they're back open now to be able to do a walk-in and, and file a report that way. And one of the, the trends that I'm seeing a lot now is uh, somebody will call and say, oh, you have a warrant out for your arrest, or your son has a warrant out for your arrest, or grandson has a warrant out for your arrest. You have to send us, you know, the bail money is $5,000 in a Walmart gift card. Uh, so people will call us. So I'm actually assigned to the warrants unit. So the number you can call is 808-0650, 808-0650. You can actually call and see, uh, do I have a warrant? And I just got a phone call. Do not give any information over the phone. Do not send them money and gift card. You can call us first and we can, we can verify for you if you actually, or your son has a warrant out for his arrest. Um, just make sure you don't give out any personal information. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. Or they don't, uh, it may be them pretending to be your grandson or granddaughter, disguising the voice and social engineering their way on the phone. Hey, you know, Grandpa, I, I, it's me, it's me. It's uh, Johnny? Yeah, it's me. I'm in trouble. I'm in jail. I need bail money. You know, and the, the sound is not good on the phone. It sounds garbled, so you may not be able to tell, and you're concerned, oh, man, maybe it really is or really isn't. And they're asked for money, or they'll ask for a gift card, or um, there's a big trend now that they'll ask for you to go to uh, for Bitcoin and go send the money through Bitcoin. I don't think SAC PD or the Sheriff's Department accepts Bitcoin, uh, Apple gift cards, or Best Buy gift cards for bail or warrant money anymore, no. or, or ever. Uh, so don't, don't fall for any of that. You know, just, and it may catch you off guard. It may catch you off guard because you're, you're thinking, geez, I want to help my, my relative. Um, but just don't, don't entertain anything on the phone. Hang up and call that person directly you know, and, and confirm whether it is or isn't, just like he was saying, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thanks. Very informative presentation. Uh, so on top of the identity theft topic, uh, we got a list of questions uh, that you guys submitted ahead of time. Uh, one of the questions, the first one is, um, dealing with homeless issue in this area and how to deal with them. Uh, so if you live in the city of Sacramento, we actually have a homeless outreach team. It consists of one sergeant and four officers, and their full-time job is to uh, deal with the homeless um, uh, problems we have in the city. Uh, so one of the way to report it, you can always call a non-emergency number. There's 264-5471, where you can actually go to uh, call 311, uh, make a referral with them. Uh, so what happens is, uh, once our dispatch gets the call, where 311 gets a call, uh, they will refer a call to our, uh, they call it, they're called the impact team. Uh, their team will get um, the circumstances of, of the call and they will follow through with the call. Uh, but one of the things I actually called them before I came here, uh, one of the message they want us to relay to, to you guys is for a facility like this, make sure you deny access uh, for people who want to use your, um, your outlet to charge a phone at the entrance or use your water faucet outside. Uh, make sure you have some sort of locking device because uh, what happens when they come and charge a phone um, at your front door, they charge it today and they're going to come back tomorrow and next thing you know, they're here for two weeks. Uh, after they've been here for two weeks, it takes a lot uh, more effort for us to actually remove them from your, from your property because they kind of established residency here. And so I've been here for two weeks and this is where I'm staying. Uh, it, it has a lot more steps for us to actually remove somebody from here. Uh, so make sure you lock up your, your faucets, make sure you lock up your, uh, your outlets um, and kind of deny that opportunity. And if, they, if you see anything suspicious, uh, if you see uh, people that are here that are supposed to be here, feel free to call. Um, sometimes people get discouraged 
when they call about a homeless person and they don't see an officer right away. Uh, unfortunately, all the calls come in different priorities, um, and a homeless um, out front at your front door, may, it's not a violent crime, so you may not get the response right away. Uh, but every call that comes in, it gets logged, and every month the captain, the lieutenant, they go through all the calls for service, and they see what area is getting the calls, and they're going to um, dedicate more resources to that, to that problem. So if you guys continue the call, you're going to get more uh, resources to that problem that you're calling about. So don't be discouraged if you call and you don't see an officer in a couple, for a couple of hours and you think the officer never, never came out, they never responded, well, they don't care. Uh, that's not the case. So anytime you guys call, the call is locked and somebody will, will have some sort of response for it. Um, and that's the first, first question. Um, the second question is uh, crimes against Asian, uh, the Asian hate crime trend. Um, so as uh, media has a lot of coverage on Asian hate crime trends. So we have a, a hate crime task force uh, that we started back in uh, 2020. Um, so that's when we really started tracking um, all the hate crimes, uh, even the hate incident. Uh, so the difference between a hate incident and a hate crime is a hate incident is something that is bias related, uh, could be race, gender, uh, ethnicity, um, that is not quite to uh, that. That's not quite to the level of a crime yet. Uh, a crime is uh, something like a battery, assault, a vandalism. Uh, the crime happened solely based on the person's race, gender, um, and that doesn't have any other motive. Um, so, a hate incident, for example, a hate incident could be uh, I was walking down the street and somebody calls a name. Uh, somebody calls me a, a racial slur, right? Um, but there's no threat. There's no no battery, there's no vandalism to my property. Uh, to that, we can still call in, it will be documented a hate incident. A uh, hate crime is actually somebody vandalized my property, my vehicle, uh, somebody assault, personally assaulted me uh, based on the way I look, uh, based on the way I identify myself as, and, and that is a hate crime. Um, so ever since we started tracking uh, hate crime and hate incident, uh, we break it down to gender, and race, and different, different race. Um, specifically with hate crime, hate incidents against our a Asian population, 2020, when we started tracking, uh, we had three only, uh, and th those were incidents. And once we started looking further into it, all three incidents, they were just incidents. They're not hate crimes. Um, in 2021, uh, we had 12 hate incidents. In 2022, this year, uh, we have six hate incidents. Uh, so actually, I just printed out the calls, uh, just some examples of the calls, and out of the six incidents, uh, actually only five actually happened in the city of Sacramento. Uh, one of them was happened in the city of Elk Grove. Uh, that was the day that our, our officers were um, handling calls for service for Elk Grove because Elk Grove PD, they were overwhelmed uh, with a critical incident that they had. Um, so we took the report over there, and, but we counted as one of our stats. Um, so, uh, most of the incidents that we had in the city, um, all five of them were just incidents. Uh, one of them was a dental office. Uh, they, were in, uh, they were enforcing the mandate, uh, not allowing people to come in without a mask. Uh, they got a voice message um, accusing them of being communists. Um, uh, the, another one is, um, um, so the, the victim call in and there's um, the person that was at the house was calling the victim a pig family, uh, saying oink oink, uh, believing that the, the person was um, a police officer, uh, or a family of a police officer, uh, but the, the person that happened to be uh, Asian descent. Um, and a lot of these, in a lot of these cases, uh, the perpetrator uh, is either dealing with um, mental issues um, with some sort of uh, drug-induced psychosis, something else is happening. Um, and another one is um, two victims were on the light rail train, um, and one of the homeless person on the train um, might be suffering from some sort of mental problem, uh, mental issue, was calling them uh, racial slurs on the train. 
uh, still not quite a crime. Um, another case is uh, three, three females and two juveniles, they went to an Asian restaurant on Broadway, uh, ordered a bunch of food, um, didn't like the food, thought the food was weird, uh, left without paying. Uh, the manager went after them and they called the, the manager, you know, you guys make some weird food and uh, called them a racial slur. Uh, that, was, that was one of the incidents. Uh, so that, you had some sort of theft, uh, but at the same time, that theft didn't happen because of the, the person's race. Um, so even though that was documented as a hate incident, it's not quite a hate crime. Um, another one was the victim and the family uh, victim and her husband was walking down the street uh, and a guy drove by and say some racial slur uh, to the victim and just kept driving. Uh, again, um, that was a racial, uh, it was a hate incident and not quite to a hate crime. And those are all the calls in 2022. Um, so fortunately for us in Sacramento, uh, we're not really seeing the hate crimes uh, that you see on TV or Facebook or on social media, uh, like the ones that are happening in Oakland, San Francisco and LA. Um, I think I reached out to the, the Sheriff's Department too. And as, as far as this year, uh, they had zero reported hate crimes against our Asian, against the, our Asian population. Um, so another question is uh, an overview of the criminal justice system. So what happens when the crime happens? Uh, so I'm gonna walk you guys through the, the, the process. Uh, so when a crime happens, uh, after it happens, uh, usually the victim or witness will call 911, call the police. Uh, police officer comes out, uh, takes the report. Uh, the report usually gets approved by a, a patrol supervisor. Uh, super, a patrol supervisor usually forwards the case to investigations, and the investigations will forward the case to the district attorney's office. Um, that's when the suspect's out, outstanding. Um, sometimes when the officer responds to the scene, and the suspect is on scene and gets arrested uh, on probable cause or fresh arrest, uh, the suspect goes to jail and within, 20, uh, within 40 hours, 48 hours, he will go through a hearing to see if there's enough uh, evidence to hold him, uh, if the DA's office is gonna file charges or if the DA's office would decline to file charges and then that person will be released. Uh, if the DA's office does decide to file charges, um, then the uh, the, dependent, uh, the defendant will go through a preliminary hearing and the jury trial, and if the person's eventually convicted, and then he will go through uh, the sentencing process. Um, so what happens when a, so what, um, what officers need to make a good case? Um, so when you guys call the police, um, what we need is more than just a good statement, right? So we need evidence that can corroborate the statement. Uh, so what helps us a lot is uh, videos and photos. Um, if something happens, if you can get a, a video of the incident or to take photos of the suspect, the suspect vehicle, uh, if you can be a good witness, uh, describe the person, um, um, description, and what helps a lot is if you can see the vehicle and get a license plate. And whenever we get a license plate, we, the chances of solving that case is, is pretty good. Um, and make sure you, you, make sure you, you always report it, okay? Uh, something small, you think, ah, oh, you know, it's, nothing's gonna happen with this case, uh, but you don't know if the same person that's doing it to you is doing it to other people as well, right? Um, so, especially we see that a lot along Stockton Boulevard. Um, you know, a, a lady will get her car broken into, or someone get th their car broken into, and uh, they think, ah, oh, no one's gonna, no one's gonna do anything about it, so I'm not gonna report it. But the same person is actually breaking into every single car down Stockton Boulevard. Um, but the more calls we get, the more resources we're gonna dedicate to that problem. Uh, and that's how we solve uh, a series. So make sure you report it. Um, so again, what happens after a crime report is taken? Uh, so every report gets reviewed, by multiple people. Uh, so usually it gets approved by a patrol sergeant first, uh, then it gets sent to the investigations unit. An investigations detective uh, sergeant reviews the case. If the case needs more follow-up, that, that case will get assigned to an investigations detective. Um, so who do you call if you have questions? 
So we can always call our investigations unit, the front desk is 808-0650, 808-0650. If you think uh, the case was taken a couple days ago and you haven't gotten in the call, you can always call us to, to ask for the status of the case. Um, unfortunately, not every case gets assigned. Um, so when I was working property crime, um, every weekend we have at least 300 cases. This over, just over the, the weekend, three days. Um, some cases might be as, as small as someone stole my license plate from my car. Uh, I didn't see anything, no one saw anything, right? Cases like that, will not, unfortunately, will not get assigned because we just don't have any leads. Uh, but we have c good cases with good leads, with good video, good witnesses, um, good suspect description, good vehicle description. Those cases usually get assigned. Um, and you can always call in and a zero eight zero six five zero and ask for an update. Uh, if the case is assigned to a detective. If it is, it has been assigned. You can ask for the detective's personal, the contact information, uh, email, or phone number. Uh, but usually, the detective will reach out to you. Um, and so, what happens after an arrest is made and when he goes through trial? And a lot of people um, think, uh, the, I know the guy was arrested, but I don't know what happened after after the fact. Uh, so fortunately, most of the cases, they don't make it to trial. Uh, this, the defendant usually plea uh, before he gets all the way to trial. Uh, so we will never have to call you to come to court to testify. Uh, I would say maybe less than 10% of the cases that actually goes to trial. Um, if it does go to trial, uh, somebody from the uh, district attorney's office will reach out to you. Um, for the preliminary hearing, most of the time, as detectives will testify on your behalf. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we'll call you over the phone, uh, get a detailed statement, and we can testify for you on your behalf so you don't have to come to court for preliminary hearing. Uh, but when it goes to trial, uh, that's when uh, somebody from the DA's office will actually reach out to you, and then you have to come in uh, so it's not a hearsay uh, statement. Um, so that's kind of uh, the, the, the big picture of what happens. Um, and so now we're getting to the stage uh, where some of the cases that I have made, uh, the guy has been eight, 10 years in prison. Uh, and they're going to get released, uh, so that they will reach out to the DA's office to reach out to you again. Um, so they have called me before because I'm one of the few uh, officers that speaks Mandarin. So they'll call me and say, we need to reach out to this, uh, to this victim uh, because the suspect's going to get a release. So usually when they get an early release, they like to talk to the victim uh, to see how the victim feels about this person being released early from prison. Uh, so that's, that's, that might be a... a a, uh, the, a time where you see me again reaching back out to you uh, and give you a heads up that this person is going to um, be released from prison. So do we have any questions as far as um, the criminal justice system goes? Do you have anything to ask on? No, I think you covered it really well. Okay. I mean, I, that, that's <clears throat> in a nutshell exactly how it goes. We're fortunate in Sacramento that we have a district attorney's office that's very aggressive in, in filing and in prosecuting cases. And to add to your point about the, the um, dedicating resource, the more reports you get of like, even if you consider it a small crime, like a theft or something like that, I mean, that's exactly right. You, you don't know where the dots are going to be connected. So the more information we have as detectives, the better off we are to be able to investigate it. And if we're able to arrest somebody, the more cases you can put together on a person, the longer sentence that person is going to have. So if they just got caught for one break in in a car, okay, they're probably most likely, depending on their history, they're going to get a slap on the wrist. But if they've hit every car, a string of cars, like he was saying on Stockton Boulevard, well, now the DA's office can look and say, there needs to be a, a heavier sentence because this person is continuing this type of conduct, right? And so the more information, the more cases we have, and same thing with ID theft, the more cases we have, even if it's a small $50, you think, oh, I'll get my money back from my bank. I'm not going to worry about reporting it. Report it because that case may be connected to hundred other cases that are, are larger and then we can, that's how we put like organized criminal rings together and uh, put them behind bars. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we go, we do go to a lot of community meetings uh, and people say, no, we didn't call it because we don't want to bother you guys. Uh, it is not a bother at all. Uh, this, is, this is what we do. Um, so don't feel, don't feel like you're, you're, uh, you're bogging down the system. Don't feel like you're troubling us. Um, that, that is, that's what we do. That's what we're here for. So if you guys don't have any questions, 
uh, I will leave my number is 808-2414. So currently I'm assigned to our warrants unit, um, but I have worked with our uh, Asian community in Sacramento uh, for many, many years. Uh, on Monday, we're going to the Indo-Chinese uh, Buddhist Church on Elder Creek in Stockton Boulevard. We're passing out money belts. Uh, so, so basically what the money belt is, it's like a, like a fanny pack, but you wear underneath your clothes. Uh, so people can actually put their money in the money belt, and so inside the purse, uh, we we'll have minimum money uh, currency. So if, if the bad guy does take your purse, just give it to them. Uh, all the important stuff is going to be on your person, on your person underneath your clothing. Um, so that's that's one of the services that Stockton Boulevard partnership is partnering with our department. And we're going to uh, distribute free money belt to the people. Uh, so it's going to be the big Chinese Buddhist church on Elder Creek in Stockton Boulevard on Monday. And I will, um, that's, a, that's a great, great service right there. And, and then I just recently went back to working at the task force as a retiree. Um, so I don't even know what my desk number is yet, but I'll give you my email. And certainly feel free to reach out in an email um, for any questions or any issues you might have. Or if you have other, other folks that you know that would enjoy if you like the presentation you want uh, us to come out and present somewhere else we're I mean that's one of the things I've always enjoyed since I've been over there since you know last 15 years uh, my email is really easy it's s smith so s s m i t h at sacksheriff.com so feel free to reach out and uh, appreciate all of your time and in, in listening and attention today do you have any questions Sean okay all right. Thank you for having us, guys. Thank you.